Greetings to all of you in Christ our Lord. As we continue our journey through this Lent, Lenten season, you'll note that we continue also our midweek services, Lenten midweek vespers at 7 p.m. And this week, we will have Judas appearing in the Garden of Gethsemane, betraying Jesus into the hands of lawless men. And so the sermon explores that theme of betrayal, specifically the ways that we betray one another in Jesus through our own denials and rejection of the faith. It dovetails nicely with the gospel reading for today and the theme of this Sunday. Uh, it, and so the, the theme will be a call to return, uh, to return to faithfulness. Uh, you'll also note on the announcement page that Zion's in the process of changing to a web-based church management system called Church Track. You, I ask you to read that announcement and uh, make use of that system. Uh, it's explained there on the page a bit. If you have further questions, simply call the church office and uh, Jessica will be most happy to help walk you through that. You'll notice that uh, also our plant sales begin this coming Monday. Uh, the information is there in the bulletin, as well as the peace auction, which is coming up. Uh, please take a moment to look at that. Uh, voting as well for Best of Carney is coming up beginning March 1. So there's information there as to how to, to uh, vote for our preschool and uh, help us to hold that uh, distinction as best of card. The order of service is printed for you in your bulletin fully with the hymns and readings and the like. It is divine service setting three, uh, augmented for the Lenten season uh, without the Gloria and Hallelujahs throughout. The opening hymn is number 688, Come Follow Me.
Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And you forgave me and my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I a poor miserable sin, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you for your kindness and mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocent, bitter sufferings and death. Of your beloved Son Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. charged them to tell no one about him. 
He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. And he called to him the crowd of his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God engaging us this evening is from our gospel reading in general, but in particular verse 34, where Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, you want to be a follower of Jesus, don't you? Sure you do. Yeah, Jesus says that if you want to follow him, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. So do you? Do you deny yourself by placing God's will before your own or by putting the needs of your neighbor before your own needs? Do you openly confess Jesus as the Christ not only by what you say, but what you do. And are you ready to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let's go back to the beginning of the gospel, where Jesus asked two diagnostic questions. The first is, who do people say I am? It depends on who you ask, doesn't it? Opinions vary. John the Baptist, maybe, or Elijah, both of them reincarnated, or one of the prophets that Moses spoke of. But then comes the second question, and to be quite honest, this is one of the most important questions you can ever be asked in your life, because the second question that Jesus gives is asking, it comes from that question of eternal life or eternal death. But what about you? What do you say? about me, Jesus says. Who do you say that I am? You see, it's one thing to recognize Jesus for who he is, from afar. I mean, even the devil does that. But it's quite another thing to recognize him as our Lord and our Savior. The answer to this question determines whether or not you're a disciple who believes in him as Savior, or whether you're going to simply admire him from a safe distance. Either you're going to be bound to Jesus in faith for eternal life, or you'll separate yourself from him by apathetic belief, unbelief, or by actions that are contrary to him, and that leads to eternal death. And so what is it? What about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? How would you answer that? Well, thank goodness for Peter. He breaks the silence. Jesus, you are the Christ, he says. You got it right, Peter. That's what we wanted to say. Jesus, that's our answer too. We're with Peter. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, the descendant promised to Abraham, Abraham by whom, from whom all nations on earth would be blessed. Peter's answer doesn't come from flesh and blood, nor does ours, but God the Father reveals it to him and to us. And then Jesus began to teach them and us what it means that he is the Christ. What type of Christ is he? Well, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed after three days, rise again. He said this plainly. There's no beating around the bush. Did you hear what he said? Jesus refers to himself as, first of all, the Son of Man. That reminds us of Daniel 7, where the heavenly, everlasting, all authority and power, Son of Man, God in the flesh, King that reigns on the earth, Jesus refers to himself as God himself. And then he goes on to state that he, the all-powerful God-man, is going to suffer many things. He will be rejected by the highest Jewish ruling authority, and more. He's going to be killed, dead as a doorknob, buried, and then after three days he will rise again. Really, is this the Jesus you want to follow? 
Is this the Jesus that you're willing to bear the cross and follow him? He is the Son of Man, Christ. But it's quite another for him to be talking like this. Suffering, murdered, resurrected. Don't you want a Lord who looks out for you and gives you what you want, when you want it? What's all this suffering and dying talk about? You find that unsettling? Peter certainly does. He won't be having a Jesus like that. No way, no how. All this suffering and death and resurrection, it's for the birds. Peter will have Jesus as the Christ, an earthly king, not in the way Jesus says, an eternal kingdom. Peter is quite emphatic about it, in fact. He takes Jesus behind the woodshed, so to speak. He begins to rebuke Jesus. Peter rebukes Jesus, the Son of Man, Christ. Can you imagine? Now we're told that what Peter told Jesus, we're not told, rather, the full extent of what he says. But considering what Jesus said in response, we can only infer that Peter did not want Jesus to follow the will of God, the Father, to save all of humanity from sin, death, and the devil. Instead, turning around, that is, turning his back to Peter and looking at his other disciples, Jesus rebukes Peter publicly and says, Get behind me, Satan. Now, God the Father had given Peter the proper title to call Jesus the Christ. But Satan, right in the footsteps of that great confession, misleads Peter so that he doesn't want Jesus to be the Christ that he's intended to be. And so he takes him. The devil tempts through Peter's mouth. Jesus, however, will not back down from what his father has given him to do. He overcame the temptation in the wilderness. He overcomes it now in the face of Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. The same words, mind you, be used in the wilderness. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Anyone who tries to keep Jesus from suffering, dying, and rising is in league with the devil himself. You see what's happening. Satan is at work, as he is even today. In this case, he uses an apostle as his instrument to tempt Jesus, to get Jesus off track, to distract him and prevent him from taking all of your sin and dying for it and then rising victorious over it. All of that which tries to prevent the gospel from happening and from being spread is utterly satanic. No. Jesus must suffer. It is necessary. He must die. He must rise again. And it's all for your salvation. It's the only way that you and I can receive eternal life. And he does it. He did it. It's complete. In the face of immense temptation to not do it. In the midst of Satan using bystanders who cry out, come down from the cross, then we'll believe in you. Or even as he endures the eternal wrath of God on the cross, even as he bears the sin of the world, even from the mouth of the thief next to him, taunting him. He withstands it all. Do you still want to be a disciple? Do you still want to continue to follow this type of Jesus? The Jesus who not only believes that Satan exists, but actually believes that Satan tries to keep him from dying for the ungodly. Jesus is quite blunt about it. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. You see, his words are as clear as a bell. Following Jesus means denying yourself, losing your life of selfish, idolatrous sin. To be a Christian means 
dying to yourself, absorbed, tuned in on yourself, lived only for yourself, life. To follow Jesus is to suffer whatever is laid upon you for being a Christian and for being a baptized disciple or faithful follower of Jesus. As it was with Jesus, so it is with his followers. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed or lived, the devil's onslaughts must follow. He comes through various forms to our own flesh, through the world around us. He comes in many different ways. But this is precisely one of the reasons why the sign of the Holy Cross was made over you at your baptism. The Holy Cross has been laid on you. That is, it marks you as a follower of Jesus. Do you think the world and Satan are going to leave you alone? Not hardly. Love your sinful life, you will lose it forever. Lose your sinful life in forgiveness and in the death of Jesus, and you will live forever. Live apart from Jesus in this life, he will not be with you in eternity. To follow Jesus means nothing else than to suffer and die with him on earth, that you may rejoice and live with him forever in heaven. Now Jesus puts the penalty of the medal even more for Peter and the rest of his disciples. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Here, I believe is where we are at the crossroads as Christians in America. Just as every generation since Jesus has first uttered these words. The question is, will we as Jesus' disciples compromise our confession of Jesus or will we bear the cross? Are we, not only for our own sake, but for the sake of the generations who follow us, ready to suffer, ready to endure all types of tribulation, even death, because we confess Jesus as the Christ? I'll say it again. We Christians in America are at a turning point. There are fewer of us now than there used to be. So it becomes all the more important. It is the issue at hand. Will we accommodate with and give in to this very seductive and idolatrous secular culture? Are we going to cave? Or will we compromise the Christian faith? That is, diminish and deny Jesus as well as his gospel for the sake of a career, a better retirement, amusement, pleasure, success, wealth, or power, or simply fitting in? Or will we act as if we can live without God's word of forgiveness? Will we treat Jesus' death and resurrection as a nothing by trying to go it alone instead of taking time to receive from him at church and at home? You see, there is a great temptation in the face of these attacks to try to take different routes to fight against them. One of those routes, obviously, is a political route, to invest our hopes in the politics of the day in order to stand up to the changes that are coming. But that is a kingdom of this world. And it will never deliver fully. Yes, it can remedy at times or stop the tide. But ultimately, it's only Christ and his means that will provide not only a return to our Lord, but also sustain us in the faith throughout it. And so confess Jesus and receive his gospel of forgiveness as if your eternal life depends upon it. Yes, you're going to suffer for it. You think that Jesus alone saves? You're pretty old-fashioned. You have the nerve to maintain that good people who deny the Trinity are 
Christians? Or do you think that Jesus is supportive of life from the womb to the tomb? Or that Jesus supports traditional marriage? It says Jesus talks of the adulterous generation. To adultery something is to change its form, to take a good gift of God and to change it in such a way that it profanes or corrupts it. And so this is the issue at hand when you look at things such as the equality bill. Look underneath the language of what it's saying, that we will take God's gifts of personhood and of gender and we will change and morph them as we wish, not receiving them as the gifts that they are, but to use them for our own desires. But society will say, you Christians, you're the enemy. In fact, you're going to be defined as insurrectionists, as militants, even though you're not. They'll try to silence you and cancel you. If you're an author, they'll remove your books. I could go on and on. <laughs> don't, don't get me started. <laughs> I, I would say. But to faithfully confess Jesus as the crucified and risen Christ for salvation, that is to live according to his word and oppose this sick and depraved secular culture, it's going to cost you something. It means sacrificing for the good things in life. Support Christian education. Support the preaching of the gospel. Yes, it hurts, but it's needful, not only for you, but for others. It's going to cost your friends as well, and your family. When you stand up to the devil, he will try to oppress you. It's part and parcel of being a follower of Jesus. And so we are strengthened by his word, equipped with it. And he is our victor and our deliverer. And so you can speak the truth, even to your relatives. And if it comes to that, it may even cost our lives. But the Lord will strengthen us in that hour. You see, such suffering as the epistle from Romans 5 says today produces endurance and character in you. Suffering for the sake of Jesus and the gospel disciplines us in the way of the cross. In other words, you learn all the more how to depend on Jesus for everything. Not only for salvation in him through the cross and his resurrection, but also in your daily lives. You learn how important it is to come and gather and encourage one another to hear Christ's true promise of forgiveness in life. You learn how important prayer is. The prayers of the saints sustain the church in this age. And you learn how important it is for thanksgiving and rejoicing, even in the midst of tremendous pain or persecution, for being a disciple of Jesus. Thank God that while we were still God's enemies, Jesus reconciled us to God through his death. And so we also pray for our enemies as well. Your risen Christ enables you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as a life everlasting. Amen. Please stand with the altar.
sins. You have captured us and released us from death and from the power of the devil. Keep us steadfast in your word that neither our own sinful desires nor worldly fads nor devilish deceptions will ever keep us from faithfully confessing Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, you have redeemed us by your holy precious blood and your innocent suffering and death. And so defend your church, we pray. Strengthen your people through your holy word and sacraments. Raise up faithful servants to proclaim the gospel, both at home and into all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Protect those who serve in our military. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Heavenly Father, sanctify our homes with your presence. Bless them with baptismal joy. Enable our parents and teachers to raise our children in lives of faith and devotion. Watch over all respected mothers and their little ones, especially Jade, Nicole, and Dawn. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Christ, our great physician, remember all who suffer, especially Norman and Judy, Vaughn, Tom, Diane, Jim, Lyle, Pat, Vi, Berlin, Ruby, Boyd, Michelle, Roger, Don, Marion, Ivan, Fran, Ben, Kim, Hewitt, Brandon, Shannon, Will, Reg, James, Roger, Sharon, Lyra, Bailey, Marianne, Kim, Roy, Lynn, Randy, Janet, Dee Dee, Ron, Carol, Tyler, Randy, Fred, Linda, John, Sharon, Jeannie, Tyrone, and all whom we name in our hearts. Restore them, O Lord, in your time, granting them peace, and give us generous hearts, using us to tend to the needs of body and soul. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All these things and whatever else we know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he has died and risen again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as I prepare the table. <laughs>
give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, so that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, and evermore praising you and saying,
blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and in soul, and keep you steadfast in the one true faith and a life everlasting. Go in peace and joy. Amen.